Part 2 of Time Crime by H. Beam Piper. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Time Crime Part 2 Hadron Dalla watched dejectedly as the green crags and escarpments of the Paratime Building loomed above the city in front of them, and began slipping under the air cab. She felt like a prisoner recaptured at the moment when attempted escape was about to succeed. "'I knew it,' she said. "'I knew he'd find something. He's trying to break things up between us, the way he did twenty years ago.' Val crushed out his cigarette and said nothing. That hadn't been true, and she knew it as well as he did. There had been many other factors involved in the disintegration of their previous marriage, most of them of her own contribution. But that had been twenty years ago, she told herself. This time it would be different. If only— Really, Val, he's never liked me, she went on. He's jealous of me, I think. You're to be his successor when he retires and he thinks I'm not a good influence. "'Oh, rubbish, Dalla! The chief has always liked you,' Val replied. "'If he didn't, do you think he'd always be inviting us to that farm of his on fifth-level Sicily? It's just that this job of ours has no end. Something's always turning up out time.' The music that the cab had been playing died away. "'Paratime building, just below,' it said in a light feminine voice. Which landing stage, please? Val leaned forward and punched at the buttons in front of him. Something in the cab's electronic brain gave a rapid series of clicks as it shifted from the general paratime building beam to the beam of the paratime police landing stage. Then it said, Thank you. The building below seemed to rotate upward toward them as it settled down. Then the antigraph field snapped off, the cab door popped open, and the cab said, "'Good-bye now. Ride with me again sometime.' They crossed the landing stage, entered the antigrav shaft, and floated downward. At the end of a hallway below, Val opened the door of Tortha Karf's office and ushered her through ahead of him. Tortha Karf, inside the semicircle of his desk, was speaking into a recording phone as they approached. He shut off the machine and waved, a cigarette in his hand. "'Come on back and sit down,' he invited. "'Be with you in a moment.' Then he switched on the phone again and went on talking, something about prompter evaluation and transmission of reports and less reliance on robot equipment. "'Sign that up, my personal order, and see it's transmitted to everybody down to and including sector regional subchief level.' he finished, then hung up the phone and turned to them. "'Sorry about this,' he said. "'Sit down, if you please. Cigarettes?' She shook her head and sat down in one of the chairs behind the desk. She started to relax and then caught herself and sat erect, her hands on her lap. "'This won't interfere with your vacation, Val,' Tortha Karf was saying. "'I just need a little help before you transpose out.' We have to catch the rocket for Zarabar in an hour and a half, Dalla reminded him. Don't worry about that. If you miss the commercial rocket, our police rockets can give you an hour's start and pass it before it gets to Zarabar, Tortha Karf said. Then he returned to Val. Here's what's happened, he said. One of our field agents on detached duty as a guard captain for consolidated outtime foodstuffs on a fruit plantation in western North America, third-level Esseron sector, was looking over a lot of slaves who had been sold to the plantation by a local slave dealer. He heard them talking among themselves in Karanda. Della caught the significance of that before Val did. At first she was puzzled. Then, in spite of herself, she was horrified and angry. Tortha Karf was explaining to Val just where and on what paratemporal sector Karanda was spoken. No possibility that this agent, Skordran Kirv, could have been mistaken. He worked for a while on Kalgor's sector himself, knew the language by hypnomech and by two years' use, Tortha Karf was saying. So he ordered himself back on duty had the slaves isolated and the slave dealers arrested, 
and then transposed to police terminal to report. The Sagreg subchief, old Volthor Tharn, confirmed him in charge at this Esron sector plantation and assigned him a couple of detectives and a psychist. When was this? Vol asked. Yesterday, one five nine day, about fifteen hundred local time. Twenty three hundred Durgabar time, Vol commented. Yes, and I just found out about it. Came in in the late morning generalized report digest. Very inconspicuous item, no special urgency symbol or anything. Fortunately, one of the report editors spotted it and messaged police terminal for a copy of the original report. It's been a long time since we had anything like that, Vol said, studying the glowing tip of his cigarette, his face wearing the curiously withdrawn expression of a conscious memory recall. Fifty years ago, the time that gang kidnapped some girls from second-level Triplanetary Empire sector and sold them into the harem of some fourth-level Indo-Turanian sultan. Yes, that was your first independent case, Vol. That was when I began to think you'd really make a cop. One renegade first-level citizen and four or five serf sec prole hoodlums with a stolen fifty-foot conveyor. This looks like a rather more ambitious operation. Dolly got one of her own cigarettes out and lit it. Val and Tortha Karf were talking cop-talk about the method of operation and possible size of the gang involved and why the slaves had been shipped all the way from India to the west coast of North America. "'Always ready sail for slaves on the Esseron sector,' Val was saying. "'And so many small independent states and different languages that outtimers wouldn't be particularly conspicuous. And with this barbarian invasion going on on the Kalgor sector, slaves could be picked up cheaply,' Tortha Karf added." In spite of her determination to boycott the conversation, curiosity began to get the better of her. She spent a year and a half on the Kalgur sector, investigating alleged psychic powers of the local priests. There had been nothing to it. The prophecies weren't precognition, they were shrewd inferences, and the miracles weren't psychokinesis, they were sleight of hand. She found herself asking, "'What barbarian invasion's this?' Oh, Central Asian nomadic people, the Krutha, Tortha Karf told her. They came down through Khyber Pass about three months ago, turned east, and hit the headwaters of the Ganges. Without punching a lot of buttons to find out exactly, I'd say they're halfway to the Delta country by now. Leader seems to be a chieftain called Lam Drug the Red. A lot of paratime trading companies are yelling for permits to introduce firearms in the Kulgor sector to protect their holdings there. She nodded. The fourth-level Kulgor sector belonged to what was known as Indus Ganges Irwadi Basic Sector Grouping, probability of civilization having developed late on the Indian subcontinent, with the rest of the world, including Europe, in Stone Age savagery or early Bronze Age barbarism. The Karandas, the people among whom she had once done field research work, had developed a pre-mechanical, animal power, handcraft, edge weapon culture. She could imagine the roads jammed with fugitives from the barbarian invaders, the conveyor hidden among the trees, the lurking slavers. Watch it, Dalla. Don't let the old scoundrel play on your feelings. Well, what do you want me to do, chief? Vol was asking. Well, I have to know just what this situation's likely to develop into. And I want to know why Volthor Tharn's been sitting on this ever since Scordren Curve reported it to him. I can answer the second one now, Val replied. Volthor Tharn is due to retire in a few years. He has a negatively good, undistinguished record. He's trying to play it safe. Tortha Karf nodded. That's what I thought. Look, Val, suppose you and Dalla transpose from here to police terminal and go to Novalan equivalent and give this a quick look over and report to me, and then rocket to Zarabar equivalent and go on with your trip to the Dwarma sector. It may delay you eight or ten hours, but... Closer twenty-four, Val said. I'd have to transpose to this plantation on the Esseron sector. 
How about it, Dalla? Would you want to do that?" She hesitated for a moment, angry with him. He didn't want to refuse, and he was trying to make her do it for him. "'I know it's a confounded imposition, Dalla,' Tortha Karf told her. "'But it's important that I get a prompt and full estimate of the situation. This may be something very serious. If it's an isolated incident, it can be handled in a routine manner. But I'm afraid it's not. It has all the marks of a large-scale operation, and if this is a matter of mass kidnappings from one sector and transpositions to another, you can see what a threat this is to the paratime secret." Moral considerations entirely aside, Val said. We don't need to discuss them. They're too obvious. She nodded. For over twelve millennia the people of her race and Vols and Tortha Karfs have been existing as parasites on all the innumerable other worlds of alternate probability on the lateral dimension of time. Smart parasites never injure their hosts, and never try to reveal their existence. "'We could do that, couldn't we, Val?' she asked, angry at herself now for giving in. "'And if you want to question these slaves, I speak Karanda, and I know how they think. And I'm a qualified and licensed narco-hypnotic technician." "'Well, that's splendid, Dalla,' Tortha Karf enthused. "'Wait a moment. I'll message police terminal to have a rocket ready for you.' "'I'll need a hypnomech for Karanda myself,' Val said. "'Dalla, do you know Akalan?' When she shook her head, he turned back to Tortha Karf. "'Look, it's about a four-hour rocket hop to Novalan equivalent. Say we have the hypno-mech machines installed in the rocket. Dalla and I can take our language lessons on the way, and be ready to go to work as soon as we land. Good idea, Tortha Karf approved. I'll order that done right away. Now. Oddly enough, she wasn't feeling so angry, now that she had committed herself and Val. Come to think of it, she had never been on police terminal timeline. Very few people outside the Paratime Police ever had. And she had always wanted to learn more about Val's work and participate in it with him. And if she'd made him refuse, it would have been something ugly between them all the time they would be on the Dwarma sector. But this way... The big circular conveyor room was crowded, as it had been every minute of every day for the past ten thousand years. At the great circular desk in the center, departing or returning police officers were checking in or out with the flat-topped cylindrical robot clerks, or talking to human attendants. Some were in the regulation green uniform. Others, like himself, were in civilian clothes. More were in outtime costumes from all over Paratime. Fringed robes and cloth of gold sashes and conical caps from the second-level Kifton sector. Fourth-level proto-Aryan mail and helmets. The short tunics and kilts of fourth-level Alexandrian Roman sector. The Zarkantha loincloth and felt cap and daggers. There were priestly vestments stiff with gold and military uniforms. There were trousers and jackboots and bare legs. Blasters and swords and pistols and bows and quivers and spears. And the place was loud with a babble of voices and the clatter of teleprinters. Dalla was looking about her in surprised delight. For her, the vacation had already begun. He was glad. For a while, he had been afraid that she would be unhappy about it. He guided her through the crowd to the desk, spoke for a while to one of the human attendants, and found out which was their conveyor. It was a fixed-destination shuttler, operative only between home timeline and police terminal, from which most of the Paratime police operations were routed. He put Dahl in through the sliding door, followed, and closed it behind him, locking it. Then, before he closed the starting switch, he drew a pistol-like weapon and checked it. In theory, the Galdron Hestor paratemporal transposition field was uninfluenced by material objects outside it. In practice, however, such objects occasionally intruded, and sometimes they were alive and hostile. The last time he had been in this conveyor room, 
he had seen a quartet of returning officers emerge from a conveyor dome dragging a dead lion by the tail. The Sigma Ray Needler, which he carried, was the only weapon which could be used, under the circumstances. It had no effect whatever on any material structure, and could be used inside an activated conveyor without deranging the conductor mesh, as, say, a bullet or the vibration of an ultrasonic paralyzer would do, and it was instantly fatal to anything having a central nervous system. It was a good weapon to use out time for that reason also. Even on the most civilized timeline, the most elaborate autopsy would reveal no specific cause of death. "'What's the Esron sector like?' Dalla asked, as the conveyor dome around them coruscated with shifting light and vanished. Third level. Probability of abortive attempt to colonize this planet from Mars about a hundred thousand years ago, he said. A few survivors, a shipload or so, were left to shift for themselves while the parent civilization on Mars died out. They lost all vestiges of their original Martian culture, even memory of their extraterrestrial origin. About fifteen hundred to two thousand years ago, a reasonably high electrochemical civilization developed, and they began working with nuclear energy and developed reaction-drive spaceships. But they'd concentrated so on the inorganic sciences, and so far neglected the biosciences, that when they launched their first ship for Venus, they hadn't yet developed a germ theory of disease. "'What happened when they ran into the green vomit fever?' Dalla asked. "'About what you could expect.' the first and only ship to return brought it back to Terra. Of course, nobody knew what it was, and before the epidemic ended, it had almost depopulated this planet. Since the survivors knew nothing about germs, they blamed it on the anger of the gods, the old story of recourse to supernaturalism in the absence of a known explanation, and a fanatically anti-scientific cult got control. Of course, space travel was taboo, so was nuclear and even electric power. For some reason, steam power and gunpowder weren't offensive to the gods. They went back to a low-order, steam-power, black-powder culture and haven't gotten beyond that to this day. The relatively civilized regions are on the east coast of Asia and on the west coast of North America. Civilized race, more or less Caucasian, Political organization, just barely above the tribal level, thousands of petty kingdoms and republics and principalities and feudal holdings and robbers' roosts. The principal industries are brigandage, piracy, slave raiding, cattle rustling, and intercommunal warfare. They have a few ramshackle steam railways and some steamboats on the rivers. We sell them coal and manufactured goods, mostly in exchange for foodstuffs and tobacco. Consolidated Outtime Foodstuffs has the sector franchise. That's one of the companies Thal von Drass gets his money from. They had run down through the civilized second and third levels and were leaving the fourth behind and entering the fifth, existing in the probability of a world without human population. Once in a while, around them, they caught brief flashes of buildings and rocket ports and spaceports and landing stages, as the conveyor took them through narrow paratime belts on which their own civilization had established outposts, fifth-level commercial, fifth-level passenger, industrial sector, service sector. Finally, the conveyor dome around them shimmered into visibility and materialized. When they emerged, there were policemen in green uniforms who entered to search the dome with drawn needlers to make sure they had picked up nothing dangerous on the way. The room outside was similar to the one they had left on home timeline, even to the shifting, noisy crowd in incongruously mixed costumes. The rocket port was a ten minutes trip by air car from the conveyor head. When they boarded the stubby winged strato rocket, Val saw that two of the passenger seats had square metal cabinets bolted in place behind them, and blue plastic helmets on swinging arms mounted above them. Everything's set up, the pilot told them. Dr. Hadron, you sit on the left. That cabinet's loaded with language tape for Akalan. Yours is loaded with a tape of Karanda. That's the fourth-level Colgore language you wanted, Chief's assistant. 
Shall I help you get fixed in your seats? Yes, if you please. Here, Dalla, I'll fix that for you. Dalla was already asleep when the pilot was adjusting his helmet and giving him his injection. He never felt the rocket tilt into firing position, and while he slept, the Karanda language, with all its vocabulary and grammar, became part of his subconscious knowledge, needing only the mental pronunciation of a trigger symbol to bring it into consciousness. The pilot was already unfastening and raising his helmet when he opened his eyes. Dalla, beside him, was sipping a cup of spiced wine. On the landing stage of the Sector Regional Headquarters at Novaland Equivalent, four or five people were waiting for them. Val recognized the sub-chief, Valthor Tharn, who introduced another man, in riding boots and a white cloak, as Skordran Curve. Val clasped hands with him warmly. "'Good work, Agent Skordran. You got on to this promptly.' I tried to, sir. Do you want the dope now? We have half an hour's flight to our spatial equivalent, and another half hour in transposition. Give it to me on the way, he said, and returned to Volthor Tharn. Our Esseron costume's ready? Yes, over there in the control tower. We have a temporary conveyor head set up about two hundred miles south of here, which will take you straight through to the plantation. Suppose you change now, Dalla he said. Subchief, I'd like a word with you privately. He and Valthor Tharn excused themselves and walked over to the edge of the landing stage. The Sec Reg subchief was outwardly composed, but Val sensed that he was worried and embarrassed. Now, what's been done since you got Agent Skordran's report? Val asked. Well, sir, it seems that this is more serious than we had anticipated. Field Agent Skordran, who will give you the particulars, says that there is every indication that a large and well-organized gang of paratemporal criminals, our own people, are at work. He says that he's found evidence of activities on fourth-level Kolgor that don't agree with any information we have about conditions on that sector. Beside transmitting Agent Skordran's report to Durgabar through the robot report system, what have you done about it? I confirmed Agent Skordran in charge of the local investigation and gave him two detectives and a psychist, sir. As soon as we could furnish Hypnomech indoctrination and Karanda to other psychists, I sent them along. He now has four of them and eight detectives. By that time, we had a conveyor head right at this consolidated outtime foodstuffs plantation. Why didn't you just borrow psychists from Sekreg for Kolgor, Eastern India? Val asked. Subchief Ranthar would have loaned you a few. Oh, I couldn't call on another secreg for men without higher echelon authorization. Especially not from another sector organization, even another level authority, Valthor Tharn said. Beside, it would have taken longer to bring them here than hypnomech our own personnel. He was right about the second point. Val agreed mentally. However, his real reason was procedural. Did you alert Ranthar Jar to what was going on in his secreg? he asked. Gracious, no! Valthor Tharn was scandalized. I have no authority to tell people of equal echelon in other sector and level organizations what to do. I put my report through regular channels. It wasn't my place to go outside my own jurisdiction. And his report had crawled through channels for fourteen hours, Val thought. Well, on my authority, and in the name of Chief Tortha, you message Ranthar Jard at once. Send him every scrap of information you have on the subject, and forward additional information as it comes in to you. I doubt he'll find anything on any timeline that's being exploited by any legitimate paratimers. This gang probably work exclusively on unpenetrated timelines. This business Scordron Curve came across was a bad blunder on some underling's part. He saw Dalla emerge from the control tower in breeches and boots and a white cloak, buckling on a heavy revolver. I'll go change now. You get busy calling Ranthar Jard. I'll see you when you get back. Are you taking over, Chief's assistant? Skordran Curve asked, as the aircar lifted from the landing stage. Not at all. 
My wife and I are starting on our vacation, as soon as I find out what's been happening here, and report to Chief Tortha. Did your native troopers catch those slavers? Yes, they got them yesterday afternoon. We've had them ever since. Do you want the whole thing just as it happened, Assistant Verkan, or just a condensation? Give me what you think it indicates, remembering that you're probably trying to analyze a large situation from a very small sample. It's big, all right, Skordran Kurv said. This gang can't number less than a hundred men, maybe several hundred. They must have at least two two hundred foot conveyors and several small ones, and bases on what sounds like some fifth level timeline, and at least one air freighter of around five thousand tons. They are operating on a number of Kolgor and Esseron timelines. Verkan Vall nodded. I didn't think it was any petty larceny, he said. Wait till you hear the rest of it. On the Kolgor sector, this gang is known as the Wizard Traders. We've been using that as a convenience label. They pose as sorcerers, black robes and hood masks covered with luminous symbols, voice amplifiers, cold light auras, energy weapons, mechanical magic tricks, that sort of thing. They have all the Krauth of scared witless. Their procedure is to establish camps in the forest near recently conquered Karanda cities. Then they appear to the Krautha, impress them with their magical powers, and trade manufactured goods for Karanda captives. They mainly trade firearms, apparently some kind of flintlocks and powder. Then they were confining their operations to unpenetrated timelines. There had been no reports of firearms in the hands of the Krautha invaders. After they buy a batch of slaves, Skordren Kurv continued, they transpose them to this presumably fifth-level base, where they have concentration camps. The slaves we questioned had been airlifted to North America, where there's another concentration camp, and from there transposed to this Esseron sector timeline where we found them. They say that there were at least two to three thousand slaves in this North American concentration camp, and that they are being transposed out in small batches and replaced by others airlifted in from India. This lot was sold to a Kalera named Nibu Hin Abanaz, the chieftain of a hill town, Kariba, about fifty miles southwest of the plantation. There were about two hundred and fifty in this batch. This Koru Hin Irigad only bought the batch he sold at the plantation. The air car lost speed and altitude. Below, the countryside was dotted with conveyor heads, each spatially coexistent with some outtime police post or operation. There were a great many of them. The western coast of North America was a center of civilization on many peritemporal sectors, and while the conveyor heads of the commercial and passenger companies were scattered over hundreds of fifth-level timelines, those of the paratime police were concentrated upon one. The anti-grav car circled around a three-hundred-foot steel tower that supported a conveyor head spatially coexistent with one on a top floor of some outtime tall building, and let down in front of a low, prefabricated steel shed. A man in police uniform came out to meet them. There was a fifty-foot conveyor dome inside, and a fifty-foot red-lined circle that marked the transposition point of an outtime conveyor. They all entered the dome, and the operator put on the transposition field. "'You haven't heard the worst of it yet,' Skordron Curve was saying. "'On this timeline, we have reason to think that the native, Nibu Hin Abanaz, who bought the slaves, actually saw the slaver's conveyor. Maybe even saw it activated. "'If he did, we'll either have to capture him and give him a memory obliteration, or kill him,' Val said." What do you know about him? Well, this Kariba, the town he bosses, is a little walled town up in the hills. Everybody there is related to everybody else. This man we have, Koru Hin Irigad, is the son of a sister of Nibo Hin Abinaz's wife. They're all bandits and slavers and cattle rustlers and what have you. For the last ten years, Nibu Hin Abinaz has been buying slaves from some secret source. Before the Cold Gore sector people began coming in, they were mostly white, with a few brown people who might have been Polynesians. No Negroes. 
there's no black race on this sector, and I suppose the paratime slavers didn't want too many questions asked. Koruhin Irigod, under narco-hypnosis, said that they were all outlanders, speaking strange languages. Ten years, and this is the first hint we've had of it, Val said. That's not a bright mark for any of us. I'll bet the slave population on some of these Esseron timelines is an anthropologist's nightmare. Why, if this has been going on for ten years, there must have been millions upon millions of people dragged from their own timelines into slavery, Dallas said in a shocked voice. Ten years may not be all of it, Val said. This Nibuhin Abinaz looks like the only tangible lead we have at present. How does he operate? About once every ten days, he'll take ten or fifteen men and go a day's ride. That may be as much as fifty miles. These Caleras have good horses and their hard riders into the hills. He'll take a big bag of money, all gold. After dark, when he has made camp, a couple of strangers in Calera dress will come in. He'll go off with them, and after about an hour, he'll come back with eight or ten of these strangers and a couple of hundred slaves always chained in batches of ten. Nibuhin Abinaz pays for them, makes arrangements for the next meeting, and the next morning he and his party start marching the slaves to Kariba. I might add that, until now, these slaves have been sold to the mines east of Kariba. These are the first that have gotten into the coastal country. That's why this hasn't come to light before, then. The conveyor comes in every ten days, at about the same place, Yes, I've been thinking of a way we might trap them, Squadron Curve said. I'll need more men and equipment. Order them from regional or general reserve, Val told him. This thing's going to have overtop priority till it's cleared up. He was mentally cursing Volthor Tharn's procedure-bound timidity as the conveyor flickered and solidified around them and the overhead red light turned green. End of part two.